Send the light. And that's what our subject is about today, taken from the book of James. If you'll open your Bible to the book of James, we're in verses, we're studying through the book, but we're in chapter 1, and today we're in 16, 17, and 18, and I'm looking at verse 17 as a subject verse. Here's how it reads, and we'll do, we'll do several studies from that over the next couple of weeks. Every good, let's see, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Remember, that's a trans, that's a, a bridge sentence from 12 through 15. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And then it connects this idea. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above. Actually, what that actually says, it's not my subject today, but it will be next time. Every good gift... <laughs> Actually, what this says is every good gift bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. That's my subject today, the Father of lights. Notice that's plural. In the exercise of his will, he brought us, gave us birth, from uh, forth, brought us forth, or gave us birth from the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, first fruits among his creatures. So we're going to talk about the Father of Lights uh, today. Um, what is interesting about this is that is the word lights is plural. Now, what is interested in this that you don't see in the English that's there in the Greek is the there's a definite article with the word Father. And there's a definite article with the word light. It should read, actually, the father, the father of the lights. And when you have a definite article, you don't need a definite article. If you put a definite article with the first word, then you don't need it with the second, it, the father of lights. But when you do put it with the second, it distinguishes these, these two unique things. The father... And the lights, and he put it in plural. He say to me, well, why is that important? Well, I want you to do something with me. I want you right now, and then I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. I want you to turn to 1 John 1, 5. If you have your Bible with you. 1 John 1, 5. Because this is a verse that people, you know, knowledgeable of the Scripture a little bit. They know this verse. And I'll get this, I'll get first John 1 5 here in a minute. I keep turning pages and I get the wrong pages. This is a verse that most people are familiar with. This is the message. We have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. Now, it's very important to my subject today. But notice that that word is singular. The word light is singular. When it says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, that's exactly what the writer of James is saying when he says, and in him there's no shifting, there's no variation or shifting of shadow. It's exactly what he's saying there as well in that subject matter. The difference between these two ideas is that in James, he calls it the father of lights, and here he calls him the father, God, God is light, or the father of light. So what I want to do with you today is I want to focus on the plural and show you the dynamics of what this is and how it relates to your life and mine. The fact that God is light, but not only is God light, that means absolute, but he is the father of lights. And what does the Bible have to say about this idea of lights? And how, do we, how does that relate to our lives personally? So after a word of prayer, we're going to discuss that this morning in the next two hours of our study. I don't want to scare you. We're going to give you a break at halftime uh, to have coffee and donuts, okay? But this will take two, two sessions, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. I give you a, a moment. 
as a believer priest, you, listen, the Bible is a, is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study the Bible in carnality. If you're an unbeliever, the Bible is it's not even a good book. You know, people call it the good book. It's not even a good book because you don't understand anything you read in it. I mean, it's just godly good. But once you get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit brings that book alive. Then, then this book becomes Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the dividing of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrows, and becomes a critic of the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Oh, that's a different book. That's a different book. And it was in my hands. When I picked up that Bible after I got saved, it came alive. It wasn't a dead book. It wasn't a dead book. And so we're going to talk about that. And so I want you to understand the importance of that. Now, the Holy Spirit indwells you because you live in the church age under the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit's a great interpreter of the Bible. He's called the spirit of truth. And truth will set you free from the cosmic system of lies. And the Bible will. So here's my point. My point is, you're indwelt by the Spirit. He wants to teach you, but he can't do it if you're carnal. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If you're aware of that, both by conscience and conviction, you should confess it before you study the Bible. You can't study the Bible in carnality, and you can't live it. You can't learn it, nor can you live it. So confession of sin is really a big deal. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. You understand that? That cleansing brings you back into fellowship and allows the Holy Spirit to teach you. Listen, don't waste your time. You came here, so don't waste any of your time. <clears throat> All right? Don't waste your time. Now, you're not going to waste mine. Mine's already been appointed for this. You're not going to waste mine, but you'll waste yours. <clears throat> and neither of us need to have that experience, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. I gave him a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you're aware of personal sin, it could be in these three categories of mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue of earth sins, confess in the silence. <clears throat> Let the Holy Spirit teach you something this morning that will just absolutely revolutionize your life. The Father of lights. Father, we're so, th so thankful <clears throat> that we have that light of God inside us that enlightens our soul through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of the Word of God and can so change our life dramatically. I mean, who hasn't had their life changed dramatically? And who doesn't want it? Oh, Father, here is the day to get life changed. To get into that ever life-changing experience with the Holy Spirit working the Word of God in my life. <clears throat> and when it does, it becomes, it becomes a ministry to others. And we look for that. Pray today the Holy Spirit would teach us truth about the Father of lights. How does these lights that he's the Father of, the Father of lights, how does this affect our life today in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, we're going to discuss this idea. My title comes from verse 17, and it's plural. And that makes a, that makes a, a study. <laughs> I mean, aren't you curious when, you, when it says the Father of lights, what lights mean? Well, a guy like I, I'm curious, see, because I've 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 read where he's called the fa that God is God is light, and he means that God is light in the same way that He is love and everything else. But this is a powerful idea that He's He's the Father of lights. This is a powerful idea for us, and so I want to talk about that. When you read the Book of Revelation, the last book then if you understand the first book, when you read the last book, Revelation, when you, when you read Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, where it talks about the new creation, the, the, the new creation has a, a new heaven and a new earth. There will be a new city called Jerusalem, a new, a new Jerusalem. And we read that. There's, there's, a, there's a couple things in there important. Just turn over to Revelation a moment with me. You probably your Bible is still in 1 John. Over in Revelation in that 21st chapter and 22nd chapter, he says something interesting that makes sense if you've read the first book. If you're familiar with Genesis, then when you read this over here, it'll make sense. 
And when I get through with you today on the Father of Lights, this is really going to make sense. So I'm in chapter 21. I'm in verse 23. And he's talking about, like in verse, like this chapter 21 opens up. And the new heaven and new earth in chapter 1. And new Jerusalem. In cha- I'm in uh, 21 verse 1 and 2. Are you see that? New heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. See 1 and 2? Now drop down to 23 because he's going to talk about the city. The city. So we know what he's talking about in verse 23 when he says the city. The city has no need for the sun or the moon To shine on it. Now listen to me. You're going to learn this today. Out of Genesis 1. That the sun and the moon and the stars were designed to put light on the earth. That was the day four solar system business. But the light. Source that did that. Is now here. God is light. That's Genesis 1.1. The next time that will be in that same category will be Revelation 21.22. There will be no need for the sun or the moon to shine upon it. Watch this now. Watch. Watch this now. This is, here is a definition of the light of God. For the glory of God has illuminated it. Why? God is light. And his light in the eternity will be reflected as God's glory. God's glory, the light of God is his glory that will illuminate the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem. And the lamp is the lamb. Now, when you go to the second, this 22nd chapter, and we, and we look for this same idea in verse 5, there was no longer any night. Pay attention to that, because we're going to look at that in a moment. This thing started the, the whole earth system going. Now, it's no longer needed. That tells you that the whole solar system is temporary. It's not eternal. Even science know that. But the Bible told us long before there even was anybody called a scientist. It says, no longer any night they shall not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God shall illuminate them and they shall reign forever and ever. Eh? That's the end of the book. The whole beginning of how this all began is in the book of Genesis. There's no contradiction between all those pages from the first book to the last. None. The contradiction is in man who don't want to accept the truth. None in the Bible. None. And, there's, and I'll show you today. This is a great example of this. This is a wonderful concept. A wonderful idea. Uh, God's light. How is it defined? It's defined as the glory of God that illuminates. Right? And so our study, and so we're going we're to talk about how the lights, because we're going to go from God is the source of light to God is the source of life, and in between that are a whole bunch of lights that God has sent. Send the light was my point. Send the light. Now, tonight, today, I want to talk about five things about the lights, the whole subject. Number one, the first thing we want to understand is God is the original source of light. If you'll turn to the book of Genesis and the first chapter, you will, you will see something. The first three verses are just dynamite. Now, people miss them because they don't study. They just read. They don't study. But if they would, they would find out some really interesting thing. And next year, I'm going to go back through this whole study of this uh, in the fall. In verse 1, it says, In a beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's, he did that. And, and listen, what God does, he does perfectly. 
You know, when God saved you, he saved you perfectly. He saved you perfectly. He didn't save you half, half now and half later. You're not at an installment plan. I mean, he saves you 100%. You're saved perfectly. All good gifts, all perfect gifts come from God, come from above. That's your rebirth. Do you know that same word above that's used in James is used in John 3.3? 3? Do you know the same word? It, when it, it's translated in English, you, you, you must be born again. Actually, that's not what it says. It says you must be born from above. That's exactly what, he, what James is talking about in James 1.17, by the way, and 18. Well, here we are. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when we jump to Revelation, we're into... Now, God says, we're now going to the new heaven and the new earth, right? Come on now. We're starting where it all was fresh and started and then got worn out, and then we got a new one. You buy cars that way, don't you? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created it perfectly. I think on your paper somewhere, I gave you, yeah, under, under point one, drop down a little ways, Isaiah 45, 18. Now, this is really important. Look at Isaiah 45, 18 on your paper. I wrote it out. It says, Thus saith the Lord, who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. Watch this now. And you ought to circle this. Did not create it a waste place. Now, let me tell you what that is in Hebrew. It's tohu. Tohu. And in verse 2 of Genesis 1, you got Genesis 1 open? Wait just a minute. What is this? I went there. Don't close your Bible. Look at verse 2. Now look, when God originally created 1-1, one, one, in Genesis 1-1, one, one, God created, listen, he only does stuff perfect. When he created it, it wasn't created. This, the reason they use tohu is because it means unin, uninhabitable. That's what it means. It means uninhabitable. Now, I want you to show verse 2. The earth. Now, it wasn't created in verse 1 that way, but something happened in verse 2. The earth was formless and void. See the word void? That's tohu wabohu. Tohu Wa bohu. And it's translated formless and void. And see that first word, tohu, that over here called a, a waste place, tohu. I said tohu, didn't I say tohu? You just didn't know what it meant. It means a waste place. It means uninhabitable. That's the word that's used here. Not only was it tohu, it was ba wa. That's the word an in Hebrew. Tohu, wa, and Bohu, translated formless and void. And it means that it was created this way and something happened to cause it to become tohu wa bohu. Isaiah tells us he did not create it that way, right? Isaiah. But it became that way. Now watch. Here's where darkness comes. What is God? What is God? First John 1 John 1.5 says, God is light. And then it says, in him there's no what? None. In God there is what? No darkness. God creates 1.1, one, one, right? In the beginning, God created. And now the earth has become tohu wabohu, and darkness is there. Was in verse 1, but it's in verse 2. And now God's got to fix it in verse 3. Come on now. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Put your eyes on 3. Then God said, let there be light. And guess what? There was light. You know why? Because of Romans 4.21, whatever God promises, he is capable of doing. Not only capable, but committed to doing it. What he promises you, he will do. Why would you not trust him? Why would you not trust him? God said, let there be light. Shaboom! There was light. You understand that? I don't know about shaboom, but that's how it got to. <laughs> then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now watch this. Now watch this. Watch this. We're day one. We're on day one. 
It was day one. Watch this. God saw that the light was good. That's agathos. That's divine good. That's, that's what comes from God. God is good. Not only is he light, but he's good. God saw that the light was good. And what? Whoa, watch this now. And God separated the light from the darkness. I didn't hear about no light. I heard about darkness. Where did light come from? Come from verse 1. And then darkness got in the deal on, on verse 2, and God had to restore light. To, come on now. Am I the only guy getting this? Look at this. He separated, God separated light from darkness. Where did the darkness come from? It came from the angelic conflict. It came from the fallen angels, Lucifer, Latin word for the devil. Latin word, Lucifer, Lucifer. We'll talk about it in a moment. That's where darkness comes from, and that's where darkness is. Who is the source of light? God. Who is the source of darkness? The devil. Come on now. I don't care how many professors you line up and tell me that's not true. Word of God will stand the test every time. And so God has to send the light, the blessed, glorious light. So he said, listen, that's the whole program. Once darkness came in, God is sending the light, the plural, and you're going to see God sends light, 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 light. We live in one of the most enlightened periods of human history. I got it, John. Give me a moment. John don't like me to get out of my stable. John says, don't pick on me like that. All right. God separated the light from darkness, verse 4. Verse 5, God called the light day, and he calls the darkness night. Every once in a while, I'll run into an atheist. He don't believe in the Bible, but he believes in day and night. I ask him questions like that. Do you believe in day and night? Do you know the difference between day and night? You know, I used to, you, people would say to me when I was a kid, you know the difference between daylight and dark. I knew the difference, but I knew what they were saying. He calls, calls it, you know where vocabulary comes from? It comes from, from God. Man ain't smart enough. When we come up our own van, van, our own vocabulary, we call it cursing. God called the light day, and he calls the, the darkness night. There was even a morning, day one. Now, I'm going to tell you something you have never studied, unless you go to this church. Day one. Now, where does this light come from? Where did this light come from? How do I know that? Because I don't quit, John. I got to roam. I'm driving John absolutely nuts. If I get out of my stall, I'm like a cow up here. If I get out of my stall, it drives him nuts. It's because of the Internet. All right. So day one, two, and three. You know what light it's under? It's not under a solar system. Day one, two, and three is not under a solar system. The solar system does not come in. The celestial lights do not come until day four. What we have in day one, two, and three is the light that we'll have in Revelation. It is the light of God. It's not solar light. Solar light, the, uh, days one, two, and three are separate from four, five, and six. I know you've never heard that. If you go to this church, you have. I've taught this. Well, are you still with me? Now, if, you're, if you can read English, you can read day one, two, and three. You're not going to get to the solar system until you get to verse 14. When you get to the solar system, everything is going to work off a solar system. You're going to have day four, five, and six. You always remember that. This light, this light that is in day one, two, and three is nothing like the light that you and I know in the solar system of four, five, and six. Please tell me you know that. Please tell me you know it by next week because you can read it. 
Okay? For sure, you can get this by next week. So this is really important. Really important. God is the source of light, and the light we're talking about in day one, two, and three is not like any light until we get to the new Jerusalem, until we get to the new heaven and the new earth. Come on now. Because there will be no need for the what? Solar system. Because God will illuminate it. That's what we had over here. And what we have is the victory in the angelic conflict, light over darkness. Well, how wonderful that is. So God is the source. That word create in verse 1, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the word create is bara, and that's unique. It's bara to cal perfect, and that's unique. Because in the perfect tense, it means to become. In the beginning, Gabarad, he, and he, and what he's going to do is he, it, it was brought into, right there by his thought. You know, he didn't say anything. He didn't say nothing until he had to restore it. He doesn't start speaking this stuff, and then he takes it and starts restoring it because it got in a mess, so we got to separate the darkness from that. Then we got to do the water business because it's covered by water and deepness, all that. Now we've got steps. God says in a step. God says in a step. God says in a step. That's a formula of the restoration of creation. It's a formula. Then God said. That's a, I put it on your paper. That's a formula. It's a formula of restoration. And, and, and day one and two and three is all working out of that light. And then he speaks in the solar system. And now we've got the light of God. And we have the solar system working. Now we're working in plurality ideas of the light. And God said, let there be light. And of course, we have day one. You see, Ge Genesis 1, 2, where did this darkness come from? It come from the fall of Satan. And one-third of the angels followed him in a rebellion. And, and we have what's called the angelic conflict. And what happened in eternity past is carried out all the way to the end of human history. And the Satan will not be in the Revelation 21, 22. Because he's done with in chapter 20 when he's cast into the lake of fire, which came out of the judgment when he rebelled against heaven and God's plan that put the sun, the centerpiece of his whole program, and he rebelled against it. Now, you can read about this. I hope when I write these down that you just don't take them. Listen, Isaiah 14. I'm going to do this in a moment under point two. Well, when you, read, uh, Reve when you read Ephesians, the 6th chapter, 10 through 17, and it tells you, put on the full armor of God. Do you know what that's? That's spiritual. That's a spiritual warfare. And he tells you in, in verse 11 and 12 that you're fighting the angelic course, principalities and powers and all that business. That's the satanic, that's a satanic authority system in this world of darkness, of darkness. And we as Christians, we are sons of light and must wear the armor of light to do combat spiritually. We're, we're, listen, we are in combat in an invisible war. Now, you should understand that, having computers and cell phones, the invisible powers business. We're in an invisible warfare. You have to wear the spiritual armor of God to fight warfare. We're, we're sons of light, another one of those plurals. We're sons of light. Now, how important is this to your life? I don't know. It should be of utmost. We're at war. Listen, the enemy is on our turf. This is not a war that we're fighting over in North Korea or or Afghanistan. Listen, this war is on our turf. And you walk around like it's no big deal. 
You have to have the armor of God on. That's the armor of light to fight the invisible forces of darkness. How is it that you don't wear your armor? This is an everyday deal. This isn't just parade once a year. This is not just for general inspection. You can't wear it because you don't even know what it is. Get it out of the closet. Oil it up and start wearing it. You know why this is not making any sense to you? Because you never... Been, listen to me. Listen, if you don't hear anything else I said because you've shut down on me, listen to this. You need to be born again. You need to get born. You need to get saved. I didn't say go to church. I said get saved. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible that none of this makes any sense to you? How is that possible? I mean, you're, you must be like Nicodemus. Nicodemus, this religious person. I, I've been to church, Ron. I hear that so much. I got, listen, everybody in South Scott, somebody in their family is a preacher. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. Everybody's got a preacher. I promise you, there's everybody, everybody here has got connected to somebody in their family is a preacher or a priest. Everybody's got one. And listen, everybody thinks that they're going to get in or they don't want to end based on that guy or gal. Well, I don't want anything to do with the church because I got an uncle and he's, well, geez. Ah, I don't want to, you know. The truth of the matter is, listen, none of that, listen, if you got him, that's all right. But look, your faith is in the person called Jesus Christ who dies on a cross for your sins, is buried on the third day, raised from the dead. Your uncle done any of that? You got a grandpa did any of that? <laughs> Your faith is not in this kind of stuff. Your faith is in the person of Jesus Christ and his work. He is the object of your faith for salvation. The gospel is that he died on a cross, was buried, and raised from the dead. You put your faith in that, you get born again. Born again, that John 3.3, 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he said, you got to be born from above, buddy. You think you get born from down here. You can't get born from down here. you got to get born from up there. God sent his son into the world, John 3.16. You know who he's talking to? He's talking to religious Nicodemus that thinks he's okay because everybody's family is, quote, going to church. Not okay unless you have faith in the... Gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. And then when you get saved, it's a gift from above. Salvation is a gift from above through the work of Jesus Christ. For by grace I'm saved through God's God, through God. For by grace I'm saved through faith and not of myself. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. All good gifts and all perfect gifts come from above. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. He used the same word above, not born again. He said you got to be born from above. I'm telling you that today. I don't, I don't care where you slide out or slide in. Make sure it's in Christ. I mean, there's a thousand churches in this city alone. Listen, it's not about that. It's about being born again, being born from above, not from this earth. Not from this earth. Here's what we have in Genesis 1-2. The earth was formless, tohu, wabohu, and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. Boy, if we, there's where we are today. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that doesn't hover over us, it hovers in us. What, don't you know that your body has become the temple of God? Because God the Holy Spirit dwells inside your body. Jesus said, unless I go back to the Father, he will not come. But when he comes, he will take residence inside of you, and your, your, your life will become a living well to other people to drink from. People come to you to drink. Huh? When people are interested in God, do they knock on your door? They ought to. This is the one house in darkness where the light always shines.
People live around you. People who work around you, do they know that you're the light of God? Do they know that? You don't have to wear a, a T-shirt that says it. You got to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit that, that illuminates it. He illuminates. This house belongs to God. This guy belongs to God. This gal belongs to God. What's happened to us in the church? That the first door in our neighborhood that somebody knocks on an emergency, how come it's not our door? Because this is where the light shines all the time. Now you got ministry. Now you got ministry. Now you got ministry, dear people. Now you got ministry. Time gap. Do you know that between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, there's a time gap? We have no idea how long. I mean, if you know how old God is, that's, that's your time gap. Of course, I'm being facetious. The time gap between Genesis 1 and 2 was the fall of Satan and spiritual darkness came into the world and one-third of the angels revolted with him. And you can read about this in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 on your paper. And you can read about it in Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. And Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 9. In Revelation 1 through 12, 1 through 9, it's a magnificent picture of the past as well as the present and the future. He talks about the, the dragon, uh, the devil. And, and people, I, and people will say to me, well, you know, that's a myth. It amazes me how many people will call things like Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 28 and, and, and Revelation 12 a myth, but, but won't do it when they talk about Gabriel appearing to Mary and Joseph. And the wise men. Look, if you're going to have a myth one place, you got to be consistent with it, buddy. Or hang that myth up and get into reality. <laughs> Jeez. You say, I've never heard this. I, I know. I can't help that. You're hearing it now. I can't help what you didn't hear. I can only help what you do hear. When you read Isaiah 14, pay attention to the five I wills that caused the revolt, the pride of, of the morning star uh, or of the son of dawn, they called him, Lucifer in Latin. Satan and the fallen angels were sentenced at that time in the revolt. They were sentenced to the lake of fire, Revel uh, Matthew 25, 41, and Revelation 20, verses 2, 7 through 10. Do you know this darkness is interesting to me? <laughs> because we're talking about lights. Now, when you study the Bible, go back and pay attention when God's got special lights going. I'll give you one. In the ninth plague of Egypt, the ninth plague, darkness went over the face of the earth. Darkness, right? Darkness over Egypt. Come on. Now I, well, you can read it. It's in Exodus 10. Darkness, ninth plague, darkness went over Egypt. Right? If you know the story, except one place, except for one place in all of Egypt, and it was so dark, it could be felt. It was dark in the morning, it was dark at noon, it was dark at three, it was dark, and it was the dark you could feel. It is the darkness when, when God covers it up, this puts the whole blanket over it. That's that darkness. That's that darkness. And he allowed that darkness to set over it. It's a darkness that could be felt. Except for one place in Egypt. The Jewish homes. All the Jewish homes had a light. <laughs> Electricity worked fine there. Nobody else could get it. You couldn't even get a candle to burn anywhere else. That dark was so dark it would snuff it out. You, not a candle would burn in an Egyptian home. No flashlights, nothing. Generators, nope. Well, get, get, all, those, get all those candles you made, honey. I don't know why they won't work. They go out just out, out, out. 
Look over there. What do you see? Way over there in Goshen. It looks like an island. Lit up. The whole thing is lit up. <laughs> and then he marches them out. He puts a cover by cloud and a light, right? Cloud in the day, a light at night. Who's doing that? Who's running that light bill up? Who's paying that light bill, right? The Father of Lights. And I could talk and talk and talk about the Father of Lights, but I have a short period. The Father of Lights. When you study the Bible from the now on, pay attention to this stuff. How about this one? How about this one? Jesus on the cross. Six hours on the cross. Last three hours. You know what God did? He put that cover back on it. Put darkness over the land. And you know what kind of darkness that is? You, could, you, you couldn't move. You, couldn't. you ever been in a, in a deep cave and somebody turned out the lights? And it's like somebody just tore out your heart and threw it away. No sense of direction. You can't, it was so dark, you can't feel. Do you understand any of that? Oh, man. Oh, man. He put that over there the last three hours where the sun is going to be the brightest, right? Where the, if you're going to have a heat wave that's going to be between noon and three, Right? You watch news and they say, oh, it's going to be, listen, it'll hit the peak about three. <laughs> darkness. You know, darkness. And on that cross hung the light of the world. And the only people who would be able to see that were those who had the light of Christ in them that knew that. And while darkness was over the land, and it was so dark that you couldn't tell the sense of direction, those who have been born again because of the light of God in their heart could see the Son of God dying for their sins as the light of the world. The natural eye cannot see it. Even though God, when he put the light and the darkness in the world, he, when he created man, he gave him eyesight. Not as good as an eagle. But when he put natural sight in, he built the inner sight. For the person who gets born again, he has, he has inner eyes to see the things of God that the natural eye and mind cannot see. And that, when he gets born again, that is the eyes of the soul that open, that become enlightened. Not the natural. It's not the natural eye and man, mind of man. It's the, it is the born again. It is the born again. And therefore, we see things in the world completely different, do we not? My, when I, after I got saved, my whole perspective of the world, where it was going, how it was coming, where it was, what, all that, all that. And as I began to grow in the word of God, then my whole concept and thinking about the whole world and people has dramatically changed and become about what I need to do within the plan of God to rescue these who are perishing. Rescue the perishing. How about these lights, this time, this time period? How about this time period? Well, you see, all that brings us back to day one when he separated light from the darkness. That's pretty much day one. And then he gave him vocabulary words. He called the one day and the other night. Ephesians 1.18, you ought to write on your paper and study it later. Talks about the eyes of your heart. Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your heart 
so that you may know the hope to which he has called you and the riches of his glorious inheritance which he's given you as saints. The eyes of your heart who can come to see and understand and believe that we might know the hope by which we've been called in the riches of his glorious inheritance, which we have. Or how about this one? Ephesians 5, 13 through 14. In Ephesians 5, 13 and 14, not on your paper. Everything exposed by God's light becomes visible. Natural man can see it. He's attracted to it. You know, at night, somebody opens the door, 26,000 bugs fly in, right? You know why? They don't during the daytime. They're just busy out there working. But at night, they're just kind of loafing around looking for some excuse to do stuff, I guess. I don't know. But all they come in. You know why? Here's Here's what Mama Jane says. They're attracted to the light, children. Children, they're attracted to the light. They're like, where's that eat my cafe? They're attracted to the light. And so it is, isn't it? So it is. Are they attracted to the light? Hmm. I think so. I was. I was attracted to it. Everything that is exposed by the light becomes visible. The light makes everything visible. Therefore, wake up, O sleeper. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine in you. Let's close in prayer. The men will take the offering. We take a 15-minute break, and I'm going to come back the second hour, and we're going to talk more about this light as it affects the solar system. I know you're (coughs) waiting in breathless anticipation of all that. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your grace. We thank you for the attention of the people. It's been magnificent. People have come to study the Word of God today. Boy, we have we've been all over the place with it, haven't we? The Father of Lights. Uh, I tell you, when I realize that that's my daddy, <laughs> that's that's my Abba Father. That's quite a thing. I'm talking about my daddy who owns a power company. (laughs) How good is that? And he runs it by grace. How better is that? Encourage our hearts. Take this offering. May we be good stewards of it, Father. Reach the perishing. Send the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ as far as you can send it from our doors. And we'll thank you for it. Thank you for the privilege to be part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'm at point three on your paper on the subject matter of the God of lights, the plurality of lights, and trying to do uh, a concept of how God is light, but he's also lights. He's the father of lights. In the first half, I told you that when you look at the six days of, of creation, which is actually restoration of creation, uh, you, you want to look at these, uh, you want to separate the six days into two parts. And when you do, you're going to see some really interesting things. Later, later in the fall, when everybody gets back to school, I'll, I'll do, I'm going to go into Genesis and really do an in-depth study of it. It's been a while since I've done it with you. But what you have in day one, two, and three, the best we can call that is the light of God. God is light, and you're going to see that in those days. Days four, five, and six is solar, is celestial lights. And that's really important. And then when you see, when you do that, separate them, and then watch what God does on day one that helps day two, and what he does on day one and two helps day three. Day one and two helps four, five, and six. So once you break them down and understand how this thing is really working, it, it, it really makes the creation 
what they call the creation story, we call the restoration of creation story, uh, really interesting. Uh, I want us to, uh, to take a look at uh, day four, because now we're in a solar system and darkness and light and what God does. So I'm in Genesis again. I'm in the first chapter, and we get to day four. We're in 14 through 19. 14 through 19. And, and, of course, we have the formula God, God said. That's the formula, right? The creation formula. God said. You know why that's important? Let me. <laughs> you know why it's important? We said God said, and boom, it was. God said, there it is. Because the whole Bible is called the word of God or what God said. And you should read it and believe it, and boom, there it is. It's, it, it, that's just how, how it works. You transfer what he said by faith, boom, there it is. And that's important. And so when I read this, when I, when I hear, that, when I see this phrase used repetitiously, I get really excited because there are different events that God's God word says, and he does day one. <clears throat> All right? Now, I don't know how many days you have in a week. I, I know how many days you have in a week, but <clears throat> you understand that he built, built them. That's the week that we live. We live by weeks. We live by days and moments. I know all that, but we live by weeks. What, what, what have you got planned for this week? Right? That's a conversation at a table if you got kids, right? Especially teens. What you got planned this week? Oh, I don't think so. Because you didn't do such and such. So you're going to have to readjust that Friday night, Dale. Uh, so what we got, but listen, here's what you miss. That God, God cares about Sunday. And what, he's, what he's, he cares about Sunday, he cares about Monday, he cares about Tuesday. Because where did these ideas come from? Came from God. Where did Monday come from? Come from God. And, and what part of makes, what makes Monday important is what God said. Because what he said he did. Romans 4.21. You need to remember that when it comes to, I'm having a bad day. How can you have a bad day? They're all good. I mean, he, he's going to say, except for one day, he says, after every created day, he says they're all good. He always says, and it was good, except for one day. Now, I'm not going to tell you the day because it could be a gate question, and you need to find out for yourself so you can remember it. But here I am, in, I'm in the fourth day. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19, fourth day, agreed? Look at verse 13, third day. So 14 to 19 is my fourth day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, which came out of day one. Oh, you're not paying attention, but that's all right. Came out of day one. So, and, and the expanse come out of day two. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. Let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. He made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. And he made stars also. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give once again, light on the earth. Why do we have a solar system? Why do you have a solar system? Here's the bottom line. To give lights on the earth. That's why you have them. I know you think they're there for outer space. No, the solar system is for what? Give light on earth. <clears throat> and you know why it's important? That's day four. What he's going to do on day five and day six is really important that, that this is done this way. <clears throat> God placed him on the expanse of heaven to give light on the earth, to govern, to give light on the earth, and he saw that it was good. He, to govern the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Everything he's worked up day one, two, and three is now coming into Oh, I see why that's so. And God says it's good. God saw that it was good. 
it said there was evening and there was morning, fourth day, fourth day. And so we have, and listen, if you know anything about the Bible and we studied a little bit, you're going to have a new, you're going to have a new Jerusalem. You're going to have a new heaven, new wisdom, new Jerusalem, right? That's chapter 21, 22 of Revelation, the last book. See, we get all the information about the first book to the last book. Everything else in between, uh, that's really important stuff, but there, there's the, there's the bookends. And we learn from Revelation that they are temporary. Now, if you study in between Revelation and Genesis, you know it's temporary anyhow. The heavens will be rolled up and put away. And I, but the Revelation tells us this stuff. It's a revelation. So we know that the solar system is temporary. And we know that we know from Genesis, from the fall of man, that the entire earthly system is getting older, and just like we are who live on it. The earth is just like we who live on it, suffering from Adamic sin. Paul talks about this in his great writings on this subject. <clears throat> so... We're, we're familiar with it. So we have the same formula of creation. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse. And so, you know what came out of this? Here's what, here, listen, not, not divination. The suns, the moons, and the stars do not dictate how we live on earth. The word of God does. They were for signs, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, signs, seasons, days, nights. In other words, out of the sun, out of the moon, for example, just for example, you know what the Jews did? They built a calendar. It was called the lunar calendar. <clears throat> and it came out of day four. <clears throat> it came out of day four. Signs, seasons, days, nights, etc. They have what they call the lunar calendar. <clears throat> a very important calendar, by the way, uh, based on the biblical account. God didn't give celestial lights to govern mankind, nor his activities on earth. That's evil. That's divination. Horoscopes and all that kind of foolishness. You have the plan of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You have all that stuff. That's not important. What is important, that when God comes along on day six and creates man, he puts eyes in him. But he just doesn't put the natural, because the natural eye cannot see the things of God. 1 Corinthians, I don't know if this is on your paper, but 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man can't perceive the things of God. He can if he gets regenerated because God has lights on the, he has lights on the inside, shut off, that when you get born again, get turned on. Now you have the ability to perceive spiritual things that you couldn't before you got saved. Now you can understand spiritual phenomena. Because when he built the eye in the socket, he built the eyes in the soul. These are invisible and they're spiritual. They're called the eyes of the heart. And that's where enlightenment comes from. Light inward, not light outward. Not the natural eye. It is the spiritual eye. It is the light inwardly that shines. And our mind, when he put the natural eye in, he put the natural mind in so that what the eye could see, the mind could perceive on the natural order of creation. So when you get to the book of Romans, the first chapter, 18 to forward, he's able to say that the, nat the natural man with the natural eye and mind can see creation and know there has to be a greater power outside everybody. And therefore, for it becomes God conscious and creation even the animals of creation can teach you there's a higher being. See, that's how in the that's that's Paul's account of Romans 8, 118 and forward. <laughs> Job, Job picks the same subject up in Job the 12th chapter, 7 through 10, and again Psalms 19, 1 through 6. And he, he talks about how the natural eye and man can understand something about God from the creation. We call it God consciousness. And that's really important. Jesus, one of his great teaching uh, places was Matthew 6, starting with verse 25. P 
people were getting all upset. They were getting worried and they were just getting frazzled by the experiences of living daily life. You know, daily life can wear you down, right? I mean, if you're not spiritually equipped, uh, life on, on this earth can just wear you down. Well, he says, you know what? You shouldn't be worried about where your next meal is coming from, how you're going to be taken care of. He said, look at God's birds. You shouldn't be worried about whether or not you're, you're, you've got the right clothes or in the social clothes or all that stuff. He said, look at the lilies of the field. They're dressed better than Solomon. See, what he was doing was trying to show them God in creation, the God of creation. How, how was it? And listen, the natural eye and the natural mind of man ought to be able to see God Beyond himself. How did I get here? How am I here? Why am I here? Yada, yada. And there's a lot of reference in the Bible about that. You know what Paul says in Romans? Paul says, this is really interesting. He talks about the eyes of the soul, the eyes of the heart. He says, he says, you can see, you can look at creation and you can see the is indivisible character of God. He said you can see his eternal nature and his eternal power. He, he listed three things. I don't know, two or three things. Eternal power and, e, and eternal nature of God can be seen in creation. The invisibleness of God can be seen in the visualness of creation if you have eyes to see it. Now, every born-again person has eyes to see it if he tunes in. You can't get it from the natural. You have to get it from the supernatural. You have to get it from being born again, being born from above. Because of 1 Peter 2, 4, 14. I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man can't perceive the spiritual things. you born again. Listen, once you're born again, you ought to be able to see it all. It just depends on whether you have an interest. He'll show it all to you. He's not playing hide and go seek with you. He'll show it all. If you've got, you got a heart to believe it, he'll show it to you. And he's, hey, listen, when you go negative to God at God consciousness, it's that he, he, the writer is going to tell us that the foolish heart grows darkened. The foolish heart, the heart that refused to believe God, the heart that refuses to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the light of God, refuse it. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 4 says, the gospel is the light of God of the glory of Christ. Listen, the foolish person, the person, the, the fool is the one who rejects God. The fool is the one who rejects the gospel. The foolish man, his heart becomes darkened because he refused to get the light. You, you, you want to remain in darkness? See, that's a choice. That's a choice. Listen to John, listen to John 1, 4, and 5 on your paper. It tells you why Jesus Christ was sent to earth as God's spiritual light. In him, talking about Christ, in him was life. That's God's life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. That's amazing. In other words, it takes somebody with a light to expose that, and it takes the Holy Spirit to bring him into conviction to believe it. Did me. Well, it wasn't an easy choice for me. It wasn't an easy one for me. I thought long and hard. I thought I had to give up a whole bunch of things. I, a whole lot of things I didn't want to give up. A few things I didn't mind. How about debt and car payments? I'd give those up, but he didn't want them. I'd have gave all that stuff up. Nobody's told me I could get saved if I'd do that. They want me to give up the stuff I was having fun with. Wouldn't take the stuff I wanted to take. I thought, that doesn't sound like a good deal. Then I found out they're not, it's not about deals. 
You don't make deals. The deal is offered to you, and you either accept it. The darkness did not comprehend it. Uh, John, John 1, 9, 9 says, There was true light which com coming into the world enlightens every man. Well, it's been true for me. True for me. I mean, I follow that light. To follow the light of Christ in my life changed my life dramatically. Now, it may not yours, but it did mine. It did mine. I followed that light. The more I followed, the more changes he's made. <laughs> and some of those changes went hard because of pushed back on him. Then I learned, hey, just give it up. <laughs> give it up. You're hanging on to a de dead piece of meat you can't eat anyhow. Give it up. Listen, in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 4 says that Satan, Satan blinds the minds of those who reject the gospel. He blinds them. When you turn away from God, when you turn away from the gospel, it gives him an open door opportunity, an open door opportunity in your life. And he blinds your mind and he causes your heart, your heart to grow, to get, he's the, the, the devil is the source of darkness. He's not the source of light. He tells you he is, but he lies. John 8, 44, he's a liar. His pants are on fire, right? He's a liar, you know, liar, liar, pants. How about 1 Peter 2, 9? I don't know that this is on your paper or not, but on 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says that we've been called out of darkness. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called out of darkness. Come here, come here. I mean, it's not just to have the light. Listen, the light fears a lot of people. Salvation scared me to death. I grabbed down that pew and hung on for dear life. It scared me to death. I was called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amazing light. 2 Timothy 1.10 And now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death. Did what? Abolish death. What kind of death? Spiritual death. Separation from God in time and eternity. Abolish death and brought, watch this, brought life to your life. Brought life to your life and with that brought immortality. Th through what? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it, you didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You got saved by grace through faith and that of yourself. It was a gift of God. And boy, you have no idea how much you got. Not only time, but eternity. We just struggle trying to get through time. Uh, we think that's a bonus deal. Now, recently, point number five, recently we studied, recently we studied uh, out of Hebrews 9.26, our Tuesday night study, the consummation of the ages. When God sent forth his son as the light of the world. In 1 John 1, 7 it says, We as Christians, if we walk in light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You see, the end degree of walking in light is spiritual fellowship. Of like mind people who have been born by the spirit of God through the gospel. People who are interested in the word of God. Who... who, who who live off from eating it. It's the spiritual energy of your life in the world. See, he's, you know what we have? We have fellowship in the Word. We may not have anything in common outside of Christ, but we have everything common in Him. And that's amazing to me. That's a pretty... And listen, you can go anywhere in the world and find these people and, and have it. That's amazing to me too. I know it's true, but when you see it, you go like, holy cow, that's, uh, that's really something. They speak a different language. They live in a different culture. They love the same Lord. And that's a pretty amazing to me. Now, it timed out. It timed out. What good is this if it times out? 
This thing's supposed to run on my time. I'm not supposed to run on his time. <laughs> the old roll away would have still been there. That baby waited at me. Now I came to a point where I wanted to do something with you, and I can't. So it must be time to go home. All right? Sometime later, computer. Held hostage. This might as well have been a gun at my head. Uh, my family lives in Michigan. They're, they get so upset with me that I'm not on Facebook. Everything's on Facebook. If I want to know something, I have to ask Deanna. Have you heard from anybody up north? I, I don't have Facebook. This, well, if you get Facebook, you could get in the real world and be in part of our conversation. Then I think, yeah, but there's a whole lot of people in that conversation that I don't, I don't care about being with. How about that? When I found out, if you put it out there, it goes someplace that only God knows where it ends up, right? S floats out, in the inner, out into outer space someplace. <laughs> I ain't ready for that. Well, let's have prayer. Thanks for coming. Come back when you can stay a little longer. Two hours a lot, though, isn't it, huh? Let me flap my gums for two hours. It's amazing. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these to come our way, both by automobile and internet. I say once again to those who travel with us by the internet, pick a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday. Pick at least one. Stay with me for a year. Stay a year with me. Whatever night, it'll be okay. That's up to you. Oh, I, it thrilled me to have you all three nights, but look. For the, you in India and Japan and Germany and Russia, we're so thankful to have you drop in and visit with us. Pick a night that's comfortable with your schedule and stay with me a year. I will show you things from the Word of God that will revolutionize your life in Christ. We'll bring you a missionary, a missionary to your family. Win your nation to Christ. We're working on ours and we're sending people to you. So, grow with us in the word of God. Grow with us. We've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.